Good morning. It's Monday, July 14th, 2014, and this is Tech Talk Today, episode 25. My name is Chris, and we got a really big show for you for a Monday, too, at that. You know what it was? I got a secret for you guys. I set aside a couple of really great in-depth stories and read through them last night, so I would have a whole bunch of stuff that I went and read that I could point you at and pull out some of the good tidbits. So we got a little news for everybody today. That's why it's exceptionally important that today, of all days, our esteemed mumble panel of uh, everybody who's absolutely awake, had plenty of caffeine in the mumble room, is here to comment with the stories. And guys, just for you, we're going to start with a pretty interesting Firefox story. At least I think so. I always like to flirt. I'm, I'm primarily a Chrome user, but I always like to flirt with Firefox. I feel like it, it, it almost feels like a more of a native client under Linux than Chrome does. I don't know. That's one of those particular describe that's one of those descriptors that's really hard to nail down. But for me, Firefox feels like it's more at home under Linux. And so I, I, I just prefer to use it, but I overall end up back on Chrome almost every time for various reasons. So Mozilla is beginning to talk more about electrolysis or E10S. Uh, it's one of the core improvements they're working on for Firefox. The feature adds the so-called multi-process support to Firefox that's similar to how Chrome works now. Chrome was sort of birthed with uh, some of these features. The multiprocessor architecture separates how the browser's core operates from open websites and tabs. This should not be confused with sandboxing, though. Even though electrolysis is the gateway to making that happen later on, they don't have sandboxing yet. They're not introducing sandboxing, but they need this done first before they can get to sandboxing. Mozilla's actually implemented le electrolysis in the nightly channel versions of Firefox web browser back in February. The Im implementation was experimental back then and disabled by default. Tests showed that work needed to be done, especially, especially in regards to stability and, and stability when you have, you guessed it, add-ons. So this is going to say if Firefox is loading a web page for you, you won't have the general UI lag out. You, you, the, the, the whole UI, other tabs will still remain responsive. I don't know if it's all tabs are on their own process or if each tab is its own process. I think it's a mix in there. But here's the rub. Uh, you're not going to see this for a while. So the, the development on Firefox 36 begins in October 13th, 2014. Okay, but when you're actually going to see like a stable version of that ship that you might want to use as your daily driver, February 16th, 2015. Oh, oh. and here's the other bad news. Add-ons that are currently not compatible with this new system there are probably a few you've probably used before. Adblock Plus, LastPass, Request Policy, Grease Monkey, HTTPS Everywhere, Video Download Helper, Blue Hell Firewall, and uh, I'm a guest in uh, some other ones too. But when all is said and done, you'll have a much more responsive, much faster Firefox that is on the path to also having a, to be a sandboxed Firefox. Mumble Room, I, I'll, let's start with you guys. Uh, Kobe, do you think that uh, 2015, February, is just way too far out there? Is is Firefox going to become just smashed by Chrome in that time? Isn't this a great example of uh, giving plenty of heads up to those uh, plugin authors so that they can get all their plugins in order uh, ready for February? You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't want something to just land and out of the blue say, "Ha ha, we broke all your stuff." <laughs> Ta-ra! Yeah. You know, it's it's much nicer if that. I th you know, it's good that they've got a long long timeline to this. Everyone can get their ducks in a row and everyone's happy. But isn't fine. it? I mean, now I mean, it's just like it's a feature that they probably should have been rolling out this year at, at the latest, right? Yeah, I mean, do you really? I I didn't even know it didn't have it. I thought I thought it had this. I thought Firefox and Chrome were functionally on a par with each other. I I didn't even realize Firefox didn't have it. Well, I don't use Firefox. It's funny. I was using Firefox last night because I just love the way it looks under GNOME three, especially once you just tweak it a little bit, and uh, it crashed on me. I, I just started. I had so I was putting this show together actually, and I had probably thirty tabs open, and I opened one last tab. And for some reason, Firefox locked up hard and closed it. And of course, when I restored it, it restored their tabs, but it didn't restore the state that was on them. So I like lost my notes and all of these things, like just last night. So I'm a little raw on it right now. I'm thinking, you know, that's what I get because when, when I have a tab crash on me on Chrome, I don't lose all my work. And now that I actually do actual work in web pages, it's kind of a big deal when that happens. It's not... Yeah, it sucks. It sucks when you know one one tab takes down the whole the whole browser. But then that still happens on Chrome. But I, you know, it's possible for one tab to take the whole browser out. But then it's 
less likely in my experience although i you know i, I like many people i used to flip flop between chromium and firefox or some other random browser and i i've decided oh, my life's too short so i've just settled on one for now <laughs> well i really like the idea of firefox being my main browser because i like uh, I don't want I don't want the web to be. We've seen what happens when one browser dominates the web. It's just not good for anybody. Uh, and I also like the you know sort of the motivations from the Mozilla Foundation to make the browser. I like where they're coming from and their reasons to make one. And that makes me want to be a quote unquote a customer of Firefox. So for those reasons, I like it. I think it works better under Linux. I like it that way too. I like the Mozilla Foundation for the most part too. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. And so, you know, like right now I've just reset up. I set myself up a new Firefox Sync account in their new in their new system. I just decided to go all fresh. And I'm liking that so far. I've got Firefox installed on my Nexus 5. I don't use it that much to be honest. I prefer Chrome on 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 there, but you know. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh since we just got uh, done talking about uh Chrome, let's uh let's talk a little bit about Google. They got some really big changes coming to the Play Store, as you might expect, I suppose, since we've seen their whole new material design that they uh, showcased at Google I.O. I guess it's not too surprising that they would have to apply a pretty big UI update to the Google Play Store, but Android Police has an exclusive look at both the web, tablet, and uh, mobile handheld versions. Uh, it's pretty big, uh, actually. And it's kind of obvious now, looking back, isn't it, that uh, the Google Plus app and really uh, the new Docs apps were kind of an idea, kind of an indication of Google's new design direction. Those are very much material design apps. So this is what you're going to get from the new Google Play Store, too. Uh, they've received information. This is AndroidPolice.com, uh, indicating that Google's makeover of the Play Store is well underway right now. They're, they're sharing some images, so I'll have a link in the show notes if you're listening to the audio version you want to check them out. I'm also showing them on the video version right now. Apps and games use the hero image or promo video that developers already upload to the Play Store. This is vernacular that developers are familiar with. The hero image is you know, that really impressive banner. That's the hero shot, as they call it. And if it's a movie, you can upload a trailer, and the trailer will be, dis will be sort of displayed in the background. So if you're looking at the item, let me see if I can, actually, I might be able to show you in this image right here if they can, yeah. So here you're looking at Leo's fortune, and the developer has uploaded a video of the gameplay. So the user now has the option to sort of have that, that video be a background element of the Play Store item. So it's making, it's taking just the generic static listing in the Play Store and making it much more visual, much more uh, interactive, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, you know, I, I could see that really sucking in a lot of cases. Uh, but if it's done right and, you know, if maybe they're picky about which ones they feature that way, uh, I think it could do. I, I, I think it could work well. The review section also got a uh, more color, colorful makeover area, as well as there's more uh, bolder icons for like flag. This is inappropriate. This has dirty words in it. All that kind of stuff is a little. It stands out a little more, especially especially so on the uh, mobile version. You can see right there on the bottom of the screenshot. Uh, so uh, yay. You know what? I don't know. We'll see. Of course, it's one of the things we have to get our hands on. But I've been a pretty vocal critic of the Play Store. So it's nice to see them doing some updates, and I wanted to give uh, Google a little bit of hay since, uh, since I'm pretty hard on them sometimes. It's nice to see them taking their new design and doing something good with it. And speaking of new designs and doing something interesting, Microsoft has a big conference going on right now, their Vision Conference. Did you know about the Vision Keynote? It's, it's actually going to be in about an hour or two from when we get off the air. Uh, but the, uh, their Worldwide Partner Conference kicked off. I don't mean to make fun. It actually looks like a pretty impressive event. In fact, I think it's already started now. I think about the timing of it because they're on the East Coast. Anyways, so it's no surprise that we've gotten some leaks for Windows 9. New features that show Windows 9. And guess who's back? That's right. You know it. You love it. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. The new Windows 9 start menu. Come on down. Da -da 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 -da. Right? Da -da -da. No? But there's nothing really new about it. It's something they showed off at the build conference. So, I mean, it's something we knew was going to be in the pipeline. We just didn't know if it was going to land in Windows 8.1 Update 2 or if right. it was going to be in Windows 9. Right. So. right. So, what, so what you're saying is you're not too, uh, not too enthralled by it. I, Wait, I don't really care either way. <laughs> Is, is, that screen that. is that a screenshot of KDE? Oh! <laughs> no, this, it is a little different than what they showed off before. Uh, I'll tell you what I think it is. is I think it's a sign that Microsoft just, uh, anybody who bet on the Metro train, any developer that they managed to talk into, either by paying them a little bit of money or you know marketing the crap to them, any developer they convinced to make Metro apps probably feels a bit like a doofus now because they just... 
They they went they went all in on Metro, and now here we are, Windows Nine, and Metro. The only way it's ever going to be used as is in a sidebar on a ridiculously large Windows Start menu. Which, if I ever get Windows Nine, I'm going to disable. <laughs> So, so I, I think the general idea is, you know, the, the so Canonical is implementing their convergence idea with Unity in a way that works, you know. They don't try to plaster a mobile interface on a desktop, you know, a, a massive desktop or something. And I think Microsoft sort of realized their idea of convergence is pretty flawed and they're back, you know, they're backing away from it. In Build Conference, they showed Metro applications running in the desktop so i don't know how developers right. will take you windowed, know to the yeah. whole thing of, uh, of it being windowed all of a sudden yeah. but if you look at it from a tablet perspective those metro applications are not going to suddenly be in the desktop they're going to be full screen in your face so. right i actually as much as i make fun here's what i see uh if i take off my preferences and i say you know i put like uh, uh you know somebody who's maybe in their in their late 50s to 70s, maybe somebody who's not spent a lot of time with computers, but is using computers, you know, does email, browses the web, uh, wants to check up on status stuff. They're not like uh, afraid of computers, but they're just, that's, it's not really something they're all, they're all that into other than the util, utilitarian purposes of it. This to me, I'm going to be honest, you know, they like, I'm not trying to, they just like big buttons. They like clear, uh, obvious icon icons. They like they like to know where they're supposed to go. I, I actually think this works. And if it's on a tablet, if you get dropped down to the classic desktop, you use your thumb to tap the corner of the start menu, and and, and then these things are big enough that they're going to be thumb thumb targets. The the other side with the little list, that's not going to work at all on touch. But the big buttons like email and calendar and settings, you know, you could fat finger those from a tablet or on a lot of Windows laptops and desktops have touch screens too. Well, now you'll have at least uh, you'll have clustered in a certain area on your screen a lot of fingerprints, <laughs> and it could be useful in that scenario. So I don't mean to dog on it completely, but for me, I look at that and think, boy, that thing is a pig. I do not want that on my screen. Uh, and while we're talking about Microsoft, last week uh, was it Thursday, guys, that that Microsoft memo broke? Uh, Satya Nadella is a big new vision for Microsoft, and I was scratching my head, really trying to. Just figure this thing out. What is Sache trying to say? And I realized later it's kind of him saying, hey, I'm moving away from Balmer's devices and services vision. What Balmer just announced like a year ago, it's out, is really what Sache's memo was about. But I felt like that wasn't it. Like I hadn't really cracked the nut. Well, Jean-Louis Gosset, I'm not probably saying that right. Uh, he's a former executive at Apple Computer. That's putting it mildly. Uh, he also uh, worked. He worked at Apple Computer from 1981 to 1990, so the good old years. He's also famous for founding B. You might be familiar with the B operating system. Uh, he says that uh, he did it. He did a fantastic takedown of Satya Nadella's new letter on uh, the site that he co-authors, uh, the Monday Note. I, I I loved it. I had to just share a little bit. I'll link you guys can read the rest because it's kind of long. Uh, but he says that Satya Nadella is a repeat befuddler. His first emails to employees sent just after he assumed the CEO mantle on the, the, earlier this year was filled with bombastic and false platitudes as well. Platitudes as well, like for example, we are only we are the only ones who can harness the power of software and deliver it through devices and services that truly empower every individual and every organization. We are the only company with a history and continued focus in building platforms and ecosystems that create broad opportunity. Yeah, what the heck does that mean? Uh, and, of course, this new memo was filled with things just like this. More of them. Much more of them with very pretty visuals, I might add. And so he says, well, we know Satya Nadella isn't a dummy. So we know he's not just spewing crap. So he either needs, like, a much better editor or there's actually some bad news hidden in this memo that sort of gives Satya Nadella the play to say, look, I warned you this was coming uh, he says, "Here's here's 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 um, the here's the logic. First, because he's intelligent and literate, he forgot to use an unforgiving editor. Sure, you could assume that, but let's say he's a smart guy, and let's say maybe he's speaking a little bit in code. Let's say he's making cryptic statements that are meant to prepare the troops for painful changes. Seemingly bland, obligatory statements about the future will decrypt into wrenching decisions." He says. Uh, he goes through and pulls out a few choice quotes here, and here's a good example. Uh, uh, here is him sort of restating 
how what Sache is actually saying in plain English. This is the memo in plain English. This is the beginning of our 2015 year and a new era at Microsoft. We have good news and bad news. The bad news, the bad news is the old devices and services mantra won't work. For example, I've determined we'll never make money in tablets or smartphones. So, do we continue to pretend we're all in, or do we face reality and make a painful decision to pull out so we can use our resources, including our integrity, to fight winnable battles? With the support of the Microsoft board, I've chosen the latter. We'll do our utmost to minimize the pain that will naturally arise from this change. And he goes in to talk about how there's layoffs coming at Microsoft. That's the next thing. That's what the, he says. Satya's memo is about layoffs. He's calling it. He's saying there's going to be layoffs down the road as they uh, sort of refocus. So we'll see. That's a sort of that won't, that won't be something that won't play out until the end of the year. But Mumble Room, what do you think? Are we about to see a bunch of layoffs at Microsoft? Was Satya's note a sort of cryptic way to warn the troops that devices and services didn't work? We can't dominate mobile. Instead, we're going to focus on cloud. We're going to focus on client and productivity. And well, that means I we're going to lay a lot of you off. Yeah, I, I think there's some fat to be trimmed, especially when he said that uh, they would be, quote unquote, flattening the organization. Uh, you right. know, that that clearly means, hey, you know, it's a little some too middle management for... layer is going to go. Exactly. Yeah. Good. I'm kind of excited about that. I'd like to see a scrappy lean Microsoft. Uh, you know, really compete again because uh, when people are fighting against Microsoft, that's when they're at their best. <laughs> you know, when it's a good, real, legitimate uh, competition there. So we'll see. And right now, I think I'm wondering if Sache realizes. You know, the problem is I talked about this when we when we covered the memo. I wonder if he does realize. Okay, the problem is we can be our own worst enemy internally. We're not going to do great on mobile, but we can deliver services and back-end infrastructure to all of these mobile platforms. And that could be a winnable strategy for Microsoft. They've got legitimate reputation in the enterprise. They've got a ton of installed base, so people could easily, they could easily say, and they are already saying this, we are your migration path from on-the-premises servers to in the cloud and a combination of in-between. That's a huge combination. I mean, that's really, that's appealing to a lot of businesses when they say, all right, well, we know we need to scale up a little bit. Or we know we need we need to have staff over here, and it's just much easier if we centralize resources in the cloud. Well, Microsoft is okay. Well, here's Azure. You can take your existing infrastructure. It integrates with your Active Directory infrastructure, so your entire authentication scheme will just work. I mean, that's a really Saj is right. They should focus on that because that's money on the table for them. Well, and part of the whole the whole quote unquote mobile first vision is that all their services are just going to be platform agnostic. It's they're going to have versions for Android. Mm -hmm. There's going to be versions for iOS, Windows, etc. So that means a business isn't constrained to only having to use a specific operating system or a specific mobile operating system, uh, and, and that leaves them more compelled maybe to use Microsoft products and services. Who knows? Yeah, uh, I could see it. And, you know, uh, it's interesting, too, that uh, Microsoft has had a big presence at uh, Linux conventions and at WWDC. And I didn't hear anything about Google I.O., <laughs> but I think it's telling you they're, they're uh, and of course, they're, you know, they have their own events, but they're essentially, um, I don't know, I still reflect on Microsoft's developer conference when they were up on stage demoing something on an Android device and, and on an iPad. I mean, that's, think about what, they, that's not Microsoft of, of before. I mean, before, a Microsoft demo would be on a Windows PC, and if it's on the web, you damn better bet it's an Internet Explorer. But even when they had Windows PCs, sometimes they had stuff up in Chrome, they had up in Firefox, in the demos, on stage. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Google and uh, Apple have eaten their mobile lunch completely. So, you know, the, the only way you're going to get market share in your, in your apps is you absolutely have to be on Android and iOS, and if you're not, you're dead. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, which brings me to my next story. Apple is using their uh, healthy position in the market right now to try to really get in on what's got to be a huge industry coming up, the whole location services and the real hyper-accurate location services. And uh, to that end, we just saw new iBeacon hardware direct from Apple hit the FCC. Now, why this is notable is up until this point, Apple's never made a single piece of iBeacon hardware. They've built in support. They came up with a semi-industry standard that's essentially just, you know, Bluetooth LE and some location stuff. I mean, it's it's not it, there's really not a lot of secret sauce to iBeacon. Uh, but on the on July 4th, the FCC made filings public from Apple regarding an Apple-branded iBeacon piece of equipment. 
This is the here's things to note. Uh, the hardware shown above is kind of a round hub. It's pretty ugly. It looks big and uh, more intrusive than you'd hope. Uh, the document also provides some technical information about the hardware. It's powered by a five volt power supply and it uses the 2.4 gigahertz wireless frequency, which you don't have anything in 2.4, so that should be fine. Uh, iBeacon was originally announced at WWDC 2013 alongside iOS 7. So it's kind of been around for a little while. Uh, it is actually seeing some use. For example, Apple uses iBeacon in its retail stores to provide information about nearby products. So you walk near a product category, you can get that info in the Apple app. Um, major retail chains like Walmart and Walgreens are also testing the technology. I'll say this about iBeacon. The, uh, the, this location thing is going to happen. And um, the one thing I like about iBeacon is it is a totally, uh, it's, it's a very dumb system. It's very, very dumb. And all of the smarts happen on the smartphone. So it's all user opt inable. So you don't just all of a sudden have like hyper location tracking and push notifications. The whole thing is structured, at least on the iOS side, I don't, nobody else is really doing it right now. Uh, the whole thing is structured around you giving it permission, you opting in. That I like because some of the other hyper location services that we've seen uh, are more like tracking you by your Bluetooth and uh, your uh, uh, wireless uh, antennas and maybe like the MAC addresses. And it's sort of it's more of an involuntary tracking. Whereas the iBeacon type of methodology is it's still, it's maybe even more accurate than those methods, but you have to opt into it. So once you opt in, they have a lot more, but if you don't opt in, they've got nothing. I think that's a preferred system. So I wouldn't actually mind to see if they're going to do this, I wouldn't mind seeing iBeacon be the one that takes off. As speaking of technologies that you don't really want to see take off, but it's handy to have Dropbox. New version of Dropbox for Linux and Windows, uh, version 211.0. Don't go get it, but I just want to tell you about it because it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's got a whole new UI rewrite for Linux. Finally, finally new UI for Linux. I think Windows got a UI update or something. Also now rewritten in Qt, interestingly enough. Uh, and they've done a massive improvement in the way they upload small files simultaneously. So they can do multiple files at once. They can upload and download files at the same time much faster. Uh, the UI rewrite helps fix a large number of issues and glitches that have been reported over the years on the Linux side. They've improved performance in general, a new setup wizard for Linux. Uh, much of the UI, though, is still rough around the edges. It might not be working right yet, so don't go install it. There is a link in the show notes if you have a test box, but even then, you maybe do it on a test account. But hallelujah. Hallelujah. Really? What, what, what's so bad about the Dropbox UI? Oh my gosh, Popey. When you do selective sync, if you have uh, like a large Dropbox, uh, you can only uncheck so many folders before the UI totally becomes unresponsive, and then you have to hit update, and then you have to go back in, and you get like another two, three folders, and then you have to hit update, and then you have to go back in, and it can be like... When, and I set up a lot of machines, and I put a lot of like our production clips and stuff on them. And it's I have to be very specific about which folders I sync because uh, see let's see here uh, let's see my Dropbox is uh, it's like uh, yeah I'm using I have 200 gigabytes in my Dropbox so I try not to sync the entire thing because that's bad that'd be crazy so I go select to sync all the time and that is the most tedious pain in the arse and on the Mac client it's just click 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 no problem so I'm hoping. They just took the UI from the Mac version and slapped it on the Windows and Linux versions. I've actually never well, done it on cute, Linux or then, Windows. I mean, then that's great, isn't it? It means they probably are doing one cross-platform. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. UI if it's yeah. all running cute. Yeah, and I've never done it on. I've, oh, so on the Linux, I don't know if the Windows side because it sounds like they made the update into the same version. I don't know if the Windows side had had the selective sync problem, but um, it's so bad. It's so bad that oh, it like sometimes locks up the machine too. So I'm really excited about the Dropbox update. Not even though I'm planning to totally phase out of it, hopefully sooner than later. But it's while I'm using it, it's gonna solve yeah, a nice problem. Like, it sounds like you need a sync thing. That's what you need. Well, yeah, I, I I'm thinking. I know, I know. I keep going on about it. No, I, I I like it. I'm thinking about it. I'm just thinking sync thing. I'm unfortunately for me, BitTorrent sync is a little bit better because I have so many things I need to distribute publicly. And I need to just give people a key and let them, you know, I can't add every single, I can't add hundreds of people to a sync thing share. Right. So I, I don't know. Maybe it'd be a combination in there. And, you know, if I had to power it by something, it'd be the Raspberry Pi B+. Plus. That's right. A new Raspberry Pi. It's an update, an iteration to something we all know and love with some really nice new features. Here, I'll give you, here's what's new. A dual step-down power supply for 3.3 volts and 1.8 volt. Yeah, buddy. A 5-volt supply has uh, polarity protection. Oh, and a 2-amp fuse. New USB and Ethernet controller chip. Four USB ports instead of two. 
40 GPIO pins instead of 26. Uh, they've got composite video now integrated with four pole 3.5 millimeter headphone jacks, a micro SD card instead of a full sized SD, four mounting holes in a rectangular layout, many new connectors. I think also the other thing that should be on that list is same price. I think that's awesome. What's not new? It's a, if it's the same actual uh, original size uh, basically, which is kind of awesome if you think about it. It's more of an accomplishment. Um, same processor. Still run at 700 megahertz. You can't overclock, of course, but you might trade some stability. And this isn't a new model. This is an updated model. So you got the same processor, same 512 megs of RAM soldered onto the Broadcom chip, uh, same type of power connected to the micro USB. Uh, ships with the same software, so that, which you know, not that's fine. 26 pins of, on the GPIO are the same. Same HDMI outport, uh, same audio part of the AV jack, and uh, same camera and display connector. But you know, it's almost worth it just for the new USB ports and uh, the better power use. I think that's really awesome. Congratulations to the Raspberry Pi. Still the same price, too, which, I, you know, they're, they're working on a new, new model. But this is a really, all things considered, the same size, same price, better functionality. Raspberry Pi, man, you can't beat it. And if I was going to run a, sync, a dedicated sync thing box, maybe I'd run it on a Raspberry Pi. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. We're running long. I had a couple of things I wanted to go over. Maybe I'll save the Samsung story for uh, tomorrow's show. You know what? I'll do that. I'll bump Sam the Samsung story to tomorrow's show because I don't want to go too long. Uh, it's interesting, but it's not totally urgent. You know, I, uh, essentially, uh, Samsung for the last couple of quarters has been in a decline, and uh, their their sales are down like twenty four percent now for Android, and uh, they, there's a lot of a lot of things at play, and it's really what's most interesting about it is. It, it, it's a really good angle and a lens to look at how the Chinese smartphone market works. It's fascinating because really if you want to look at what's wrong with Samsung, you really kind of have to start to look at the Chinese smartphone market. And there's some really interesting things happening over there. And the other thing that's really interesting is how Android and Android being a common platform is clearly, clearly playing a role uh, for Samsung in this scenario. So I'm going to continue to, I'll just continue to digest all of it and uh, think about it, and we'll cover it in a future show. No big deal. It's something we can talk about in the future because it's not, it's not all that timely. Uh, before we run, I wanted to uh, mention our Patreon page over at patreon.com slash today. This is our initiative to fund the Jupiter Broadcasting Network's future projects, hire some contractors to get people in here to do some work for us, and fix a few things up and replace some aging hardware. Even though we're in a brand new studio, the really uh, all of the hardware except for a few, well... 70% of the hardware, I would say, uh, came from the old studio. So, for example, um, we are using the same camera we have used since our very, very first live stream. It's a very old camera, <laughs> and uh, it eventually is going to die because it runs so much. Uh, but it also, we need a higher resolution so we can uh, do a, uh, we can do different kinds of shots. It, it's very complicated. But the other thing we could do is if we replace this camera while it's still working, is this could become my field camera, which would be awesome. Because, like, for example, next week... Uh, I'm going to be at OSCon. Uh, I don't actually have a camera to take with me to OSCon. I, I, mean, I don't have, like, I don't have, like, you know, because actual production cameras that record in the formats we need in the resolutions start at $1,200, right? So I don't just have a $1,200 camera sitting around. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to get audio clips. This is an example of things that you can help us accomplish by going over to patreon.com slash today and just doing a monthly pledge. It also keeps this show on the air and my friends... We are very close to the next milestone. We are at currently 247 patrons, $2,323 a month and 33 cents. The next milestone, $2,400. We are less than $100 away from the next milestone. It would be amazing to hit that, especially why it's nice out, because if we can time it right, I want to send out a thank you to some of our patrons. And we also have a challenge we want to do. But also then we really, you know, it's like, boom, once we hit that milestone, that's like, wow, okay, these are the things we can afford on a monthly basis. And that's going to be huge from a predictability standpoint and a planning standpoint. I'm really, really thankful for everyone who becomes a patron over at patreon.com slash today. Thanks for keeping these shows on the air. Thanks for keeping us on the air. And thanks for your support. Any amount you can afford from a dollar up is appreciated. We also have some suggested pledge levels and some limited swag slots available still. Patreon.com slash today. Thanks, everybody, for your support. And tune in tomorrow. Tune in all week, won't you? Today, tomorrow, Monday through Thursday for Tech Talk Today. We do it live. You can hang out in the Mumble Room and join our panel of vetted experts on all things technology. Share your insights. You could, Why not? It's like, it's, like the, it's the new version of a morning call-in show, only it's about technology. 
and you don't have to call in so much as just join a queue room, get your audio checked out, and then chill with us. That's way better, right? It's like if we if, if morning call-in shows are going to be rebooted, this is how you would do it. And that's why we're doing it this way. We'd love to see you at jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted in your time zone. And if you want to give us some feedback, techtalktoday.reddit.com. That's the subreddit. You can also submit stories there, vote them up, down, comment on stories. Or go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click the contact link. And then choose Tech Talk Today from the drop down and send in your emails. I'll be reading those soon. And I might be doing a feedback-heavy episode, so please do send them in. I think I might pre-record one or two episodes ahead while I'm down at OSCon, and I would love to get feedback into those episodes. So it's a good chance to get your thoughts into the show on any technology topic or anything related to the show. Hit the contact link over on our site or techtalktoday.reddit.com. All right, so we talked about Jean-Louis, and uh, he was the one that did the good takedown of uh, Sachi Nadella's memo. I want you to go read that, too. It's in the show notes. Honestly, if you're not doing this for yourself... Uh, get a pocket account or get an Instapaper account. I use Instapaper, but get one of these services. There's also some open open source ones I'm looking at, and they're not as nice, but I'm looking at them. Get these for yourself. And sometimes when we cover these stories in these shows, even if you don't have time to read it right now, you might have a Saturday evening or you know one weird night or morning where you just need to read something, kind of like if you had a newspaper. Use these services to read these stories we sometimes link to. Because I tell you what, guys, over a week period, even if it's just one or two links a day, and you think about it, even if you just listen to each Jupiter Broadcasting show that comes out every day, I guarantee you there's going to be a link in every show's show notes that's worth further reading. And if you just grabbed one or two a day, by the weekend, you'd have some great weekend reading stored up in your Instapaper app or your Pocket app or whatever you use. It's really a nice experience because then you just get your pick of the litter and you can check them out. So we have some great ones linked in today's show. These are all nice, long ones that I read. I recommend you read them, too, and enjoy them. And uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Anyways, back to Jean-Louis. So Jean-Louis uh, worked for Apple back in the 80s. And uh, interestingly enough, he was kind of pushed out by Scully and the board. And one of the reasons he was pushed out was they weren't really happy with how he was introducing new products because he was the lead of worldwide products. And I got to tell you, I disagree. Here's a moment. It's only 30 seconds, but it's so perfect. Jean-Louis is up on stage demoing a new Apple product, very casual, and they're having some major demo fail. They're trying to show how the modems can dial out and connect to the data bank and blah, 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 right? Like really great like 80s stuff. And they can't dial out, and he's trying to get it to work, and the phone rings. So he picks up the phone in the middle of the keynote. Joe's Pizza? <laughs> Uh, you, you might have the, the wrong number. This is a, a stage where I'm doing a, a demonstration in front of thousands of people. I'm not kidding. This is, this is, this is a real call, which is why we have so many problems. So, uh, <laughs> no, so, sorry. No, seriously, seriously. Okay, you heard the applause, though? <laughs> well, 